in the initial discussions of the look of the show when we were doing the pilot, it sort of be, first became a list of what we don't want to do because this was a period show. We didn't want a faded sort of sepia tone period look. They wanted it to be vibrant, colorful, and it would be all about the performances, uh, keeping up with the actors, you know, sort of more like the 50s movies and advertisements of the day had, which was very strong. I, I almost call it an aggressively pastel. You know, you'd have a, a strong pink or peach or, or yellow, but offset against the neutral background so that you really saw the color pop out, but it wasn't necessarily always saturated color. We shot the pilot on a regular Alexa and had an Alexa Mini for the Steadicam. And then we went to series. We just uh, swatched, switched all the cameras to an Alexa Mini. That way I wouldn't have to constantly think about where the smaller camera should go in each setup. And the Alexa Mini is light enough to be able to use not only on the Steadicam, but also on a Movi. At first we had to get smaller lenses. We had to find old super speeds and things, but um, the Movi, uh, Pro sort of uh, expanded their weight capacity so they could handle the regular uh, Primo lenses that we were using. I'm just sort of used to Amy thinking of scenes as dance numbers, even when they're dialogue scenes, the way he, she choreographs people is almost rarely in a straight line move. They do figure eights, they figure S's, they, they back up, they spin, um, the camera counter spins sometimes. It's never a kind of an A to B way of approaching the scene. It's always, it's always a kind of a elaborate uh, motion. She likes to play scenes from top to bottom with the actors so they don't have to cut their performance up. So even scenes that we're going to cover, we often play most of the scene in one shot or we will stage multiple cameras uh, to pick up the performers. The show goes on and I don't want to say good night. I also think that Amy loves to see the space and the costumes. That's why we don't shoot close-ups generally. We, our close-ups are like waist up. So you're always maintaining a sense of space, even in a single. You always see the environment. And it's just a way of establishing where we are at the period setting. The environment is so much part of the characters, you know, whether they're in the Upper West Side or in Miami is constantly a story element. So I don't think she wants to see background just dissolve into kind of blurriness. Now you're getting it. I'm not on first. That's not the point. If they call my name and I'm there, then I am not late. Yeah, that's not how lateness works. There's a clock involved. At the USO show, was always conceived by Amy to be a winner. The question was, uh, how, do we, how do we cover the speeding Jeep dialogue scene and then continue with a walking shot? A Jim McConkey, my Steadicam operator, suggested instead that we go with a, a grip trick, so this is like an electric golf cart, and that we would drive them uh, to the point where the grip tricks and the Jeep would get as close as possible together with the stunt driver on both the, the Jeep and the grip tricks. And Jim would shoot it with the Steadicam. And that way, when we got to the end of the move, he could just step off the grip tricks, which then had to immediately drive forward and hide into a tent that we had uh, built on the uh, hangar. For the winner, uh, I didn't want to use a zoom if I didn't have to for two reasons. One is it's a little heavier, which means Jim is going to have to operate the steady cam with the, with the zoom, which is, he could do that fine. But the other issue that was more worrying to me was that we, as we backed up, we would have an increasingly brighter and brighter stage door in the background. And zooms having more glass elements in them would tend to flare and veil more. And I just didn't want this big lens flare over their faces uh, that could happen because I was using a zoom lens. So I was sort of determined to do this all on a prime lens and we did it, I think all on the 24, which is our basic uh, go-to lens. Este loco, loco the Cuban Club was in episode five of the third season. It was a little harder to prep for this because we're now in full production mode, although we had a little bit of downtime between going to Miami and then coming back to New York. We built a, uh, the Cuban Club on a stage we had. The issue here was that we were 
copying almost exactly a shot in the movie I Am Cuba, it, up to a moment. The beginning of, of the Cuban nightclub scene in I Am Cuba uh, begins with a singer moving through rows of bamboo, coming up to some women at a curved bar counter. And that whole movement uh, was recreated by us exactly. But once he leaves that bar counter, the camera passes him. And at that point, it's completely new. It's not at all like I Am Cuba. The whole sequence was shot as a one -er, but then after we finished it, Amy asked for a single of Eleni and a single of Midge sitting there looking at each other. In terms of the colored lighting, I, I Am Cuba is a black and white movie. It's lit with extreme sort of shafts of light uh, in this dark club, which is almost an abstract space. I almost think they just took a kind of empty stage and dressed it with smoke and shafts of light to create a club setting. So. For me, uh, cross-fading between the different colors was my attempt to find a color version of a black and white movie. You know, I knew with the song he was singing that it had to, the, the lighting had to constantly undulate and change. Started in the cyan because that felt more like a black and white movie. And then as he starts to sing, the first color comes up as pink. And then we're cross-fading between pink and cyan until the second song begins. Uh, where I start fading in yellow. And because we see the lighting in the ceiling, I couldn't use modern LED lights that could actually switch internally to different colors. That just didn't exist in 1960. So every time you switch from a pink light to a yellow light or a blue light, it had to switch to a second light or a third light. So when I decided it would switch between pink and cyan, that meant all my lighting in the grid had to be doubled. And once I added yellow, it all had to be tripled. So if I added one more color, it would have been quadrupled. And I already had something like 60 lights hung up there just for the three colors. I couldn't uh, fit any more lights in that small space. So the shot is, starts out with another step off of a crane with a steady cam. We start on the neon sign in the sky. We crane down to reveal Midge and Lenny coming out of a diner area and the camera pans like 90 degrees and starts to chase them. And at that point, the steady cam steps off the crane and starts to follow them. Now, right off the bat, we have one problem is that whenever you do a step off of a crane, someone actually has to step onto the crane to compensate for the weight. And then the crane is there for the rest of the shots. So as we chase their backs, the crane is behind their backs with a grip standing on it the whole time. Uh, you won't see that until the very end of the sequence uh, where we had to digitally paint out the crane because we chase their backs all the way to Lenny Bruce's door. Then we land on a 50-50 shot. And then as she walks away from Lenny, we rotate around Lenny to see her walking away with the pool in the background, which in the far, far background is the original diner that they came out of and the crane that they camera stepped off of. So that crane in the deep background had to be painted out later in post. So as we chase them along the pool, there's a second camera now picking them up. So we have two cameras simultaneously covering that moment. And then when they leave the pool area, it's back to just the steady cam. But then the, they open the hotel door and there's a, another camera waiting for them on the inside of the room, looking at them, looking into the room. So for that, we actually uh, put the camera in the hallway that connects to the bathroom and plugged it with a white card and cut a hole for the lens. So you would just see a white wall with a little lens hole. And Lenny himself, his body blocks the hole in the wall that the lens was sticking through. So we never had to paint that out, but we were prepared to paint that hole out. The trouble is that that camera is looking at Lenny and Midge and behind their backs, you see the steady cam hovering behind Lenny. So we had to put a piece of green card around the lens and part of the steady cam and then uh, erase the steady cam in post with the night background that was behind Lenny's back there. Everything was shot all at the same time, uh, except that when Midge walks away from Lenny, uh, there's a cut back to Lenny's reaction, which is the only bit of coverage we did after we ran all those cameras. And that was shot at night. Now there's no uh, twilight left. It's part of the Miami look I felt was these sort of twilight, these blue-green cyan colors mixed with the warm light and the blue skies. Uh, in general, Miami is a fairly blue city, you know, it's, you got the blue ocean, you got a lot of white buildings, uh, a lot of aquamarine. So I felt that the cool white fluorescent dome lights uh, 
which you normally wouldn't use, uh, would add this kind of cyan quality to the night scene, along with the pool lighting, which was very cyan as well. Mm -hmm.